Thank you everyone for joining the program today. My name is Paul Lindbergh, Assistant Director of Global Engagement here from the New York office. Really excited about today's program. I have some very brief housekeeping items. Um, we will be recording this program, which just commenced, and we'll be sharing that with all of the registrants after the program. If you have any questions during the program, please use the Q&A function. Um, and finally, as a SIPA alumnus myself, I really am excited to hear the wonderful talk today. But let's start everything off with the president of the Belgium Alumni Club, passing it over to you, Chantel. Chantal, I think you're muted. Okay, that should be better. <laughs> um, thank you, Paul, first of all. Uh, good evening, guten Abend, bonsoir, dobry viacor, buenas noches, kalispera, salam aleikum. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, um, it's really a pleasure to welcome you tonight. My name is Chantal Schuster. I am the president of the Columbia University Club of Belgium. I'm a graduate of the Columbia School of General Studies, class of 2006 and SIPA class of 2007. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you tonight to a generation of independence, 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, a conversation with former US Ambassador Daniel Fried, SIPA class of 1977, on the geopolitics of the nation states that emerged from 1991. When I reflected about the event uh, today, uh, it occurred to me that a few of you may not even have been born yet when all this happened, or to have witnessed the chain of events that led to the fall of the Soviet Union. It was definitely a defining moment in history, and I do remember the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November 1989 as one of the, the, the most amazing moments in my life. We knew that something major had happened. We didn't know yet what was going to happen afterwards, though. Uh, and this was just one of the events that led. There was really a chain of events. Uh, the topic has definitely raised a lot of interest within the Columbia alumni community, and it turned into an international gathering with alumni registering from 19 countries. Uh, Europe, Austria, Belgium, uh, amongst them, Chile, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Kazakhstan, Malta, Netherlands, Poland, Spain, Switzerland, Tunisia, United Arab Emirates, the UK, and the US. And across schools, uh, Barnard College, uh, the Business School, Columbia College, Journalism, Law, Graduate School of Arts and Science, uh, Vagelos, Physicians and Surgeons, SEAS, Engineering, GSAPP, Architecture, SIPA, of course, uh, General Studies, and the School of the Arts. A warm welcome uh, to each and every one of you. Of you. Um, I would like to express our sincere appreciation and thank all those who helped to make this event happen. First of all, to you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for saying yes so quickly and for your flexibility. I am especially pleased to welcome you, like Paul mentioned earlier, as a SIPA alum, uh, and I thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, once again, Paul, thanks to you as well for your tireless work behind the scenes and uh, all the support you give us throughout the, throughout the year and to that you gave us for this event. And last but not least, thank you, Rick, for bringing this topic to us and for being our moderator tonight. And let me just introduce you, Rick, to you. Uh, see you, um, Columbia University Club of Belgium board member. Uh, Rick Setnik is a Columbia journalism class of 1990, 1999. He is a dual citizen of the US and Slovakia where he lived for most of the 1990s and co-founded the Slovak Spectator newspaper. Today, he is vice chair of the Euroactive Media Network and an advisor to women political leaders, the global network of female politicians. Um, before handing over to Rick, let me say once more on behalf of the Combat Club of Belgium, a very warm welcome, and I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. Rick, I hand over to you. Chantal, thanks very much. And you'll have to excuse the journalist in me for doing a quick fact check. I was in class of 1994, but that's, uh, yeah. that's fine, <laughs> thanks. Um, so thanks so much, Chantal. I'm excited for this conversation, especially uh, to make it interactive with those who have, who have joined us from, as Chantal has, has uh, told us, from around Europe and beyond. Um, so a little bit more than halfway through our hour, I'll open up the conversation to questions. 
So please do put them, as Paul mentioned, in writing, include your name, your country, Columbia affiliation. It'll help us know uh, where these questions are coming from and, and uh, who you are. And I'll do my best to include as many of them as possible. 30 years ago today, the final round of the Soviet Union's collapse began. Now the dissolution had started already in 1990 and gathered momentum in 1991 with the Baltics regaining their independence and achieving UN membership already in September of 1991. But on December 1st of that year, Ukraine had a popular referendum which resulted in 91% of voters voting for independence, thus splitting the two largest, most powerful republics of the former Soviet Union. And by Christmas, Gorbachev was out and the union was dead. So we, with the benefit of time, we can reflect on those events 30 years ago with far greater perspective than was possible in the heat of the moment. But rather than re merely recount, rather than uh, merely recount a hi uh, history, we'd like to reconsider what lessons can be learned from the post-Soviet experience to benefit countries now struggling to emerge from autocracy and political stalemate, whether they be former Soviet republics, obviously places like Belarus are in the news, or elsewhere, uh, former the successor states to former Yugoslavia, or even in other parts of the world. So we may we may touch on any or all of those. This conversation will draw upon the vast wealth of experience and expertise held by our speaker, who is a distinguished alum, as we've heard, of the Columbia School of International Affairs, as Sipa was known when he graduated in 1977. In the course of his 40-year foreign service career, Ambassador Daniel Fried played a key role in designing and implementing American policy in Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union, becoming one of the United States government's foremost experts on Central and Eastern Europe and Russia. He's currently the Weiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council. It's my pleasure to welcome Ambassador Daniel Fried. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us and I uh, really do appreciate it. So what I like to do within a conversation like this is start by talking a little bit about um, on a personal basis. And I know that you were born into a Polish speaking family in the United States. And so Eastern Europe and its tumultuous history were personal. Now I'm interested if you can sort of tell us a little bit about how you would describe your perception of the Soviet Union during the Cold War growing up. My perception, um, my generation grew up in the shadow of World War II. My family, um, and my wife's family were, for them, it wasn't abstract, okay? My family was mostly in the United States. We had some cousins in Europe. My wife's family, you know, during World War II were Ukrainian peasants in pre-war Poland and spent the war on, in German labor camps, basically, forced labor. The world of divided Europe, the world of the Iron Curtain, was the world I was born into, and the world that it was assumed, including by Columbia folks, in the 1970s when I was there, was eternal. The division of Europe was permanent. The, the verdict of history was, was final. That Western Europe would be free, the line of the Iron Curtain was permanent, and the Soviet Union would last forever. Well, whoops, um, that'll teach you. What looked impossible looks in retrospect to be inevitable, but it wasn't inevitable. It could have turned out differently. And that is instructive, especially now, because Putin wants to reassemble the Soviet Union. You mentioned Ukraine. You know, Ukraine splitting off and voting in the referendum for independence. Well, Putin wants it back. He said as much. So, and, so sorry. Yeah. No, so, and, and I'm really keen to talk about current events because I think it's so, it, you know, the history in that we're talking about tonight is resonating so loudly in what's happening, you know, in the present. Um, what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the history and then, and then set that context so that we can understand sort of the lessons maybe and, and apply them to the sure. present. And let me, let me just again, continue a little bit on a personal vein. So sure. um, you went from SIPA 
to the State Department. But when would you say you decided you wanted to be a diplomat? My, after my junior year at Cornell, where I was an undergraduate, I took a job, you're gonna laugh, as a babysitter, a nanny for the kids of an American di embassy family, US diplomat living in Moscow. This is 1973. And I spent about seven, eight months over there. And I was, in those days, the Soviets, thought of nannies as servants. The fact that there was a student who was a nanny, sort of, I was invisible to them. So every evening, the kids are in bed and I'm out on the streets. I'm free. I could do anything I wanted and spent my time with Soviet students, <clears throat> underground rock concerts, you know, a, dormitories being raided by the police because they, they were playing rock and roll music. Um, I came back with pretty good street Russian. And then I thought the coolest thing ever would be a job where they would actually pay me to do what I had just been doing. That is getting to know Soviet society. And I said, I grew up in the shadow of World War II. Well, I wanted to know as a university student how we got into this mess. What happened? Why did the West not resist Hitler? Why did we get such a, why did we win World War II get such, but get such a bad deal of a divided Europe? How did we get into this mess? And, you know, what can I do to get us out of it? I never thought that I would be lucky enough to have participated in US policy around the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, specifically the fall of communism in Poland that I was, you know, I was involved in the, in the American government reaction to it. So, so kind of best thing ever. But to answer your question, look, I needed a steady paycheck. But the fact that they would send me, you know, back to the Soviet Union to sort of get to keep knowing the streets. Best thing ever. So, OK, so I hadn't actually realized what you've just described. So so when you were a student, that was how old? Well, I was 20 years old when I was in the Soviet Union. Okay. I turned 21 there. Okay. And and you were sent back quite early in your career in, in the State right. Department. First right? overseas tour, um, I volunteered for Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Um, there weren't a lot of volunteers. It was a very isolated place. Um, the KGB was even more restrictive in Leningrad than in Moscow. Vladimir Putin was then working in the KGB in Leningrad. Um, I'd like to think he reviewed my file. Um, I had all sorts of adventures with those folks. But to me, the idea of Leningrad was perfect because I was interested in Soviet reality, not just the foreign policy. And so it was a perfect place for me. And so you were there, if I uh, note this correctly, in 1980, 1981. That's right, between the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and martial law in Poland. So relations were bad and they were getting worse, sort of like today. Okay, and then you you were there at the time, you, but you, I guess, did you get the sense with, with solidarity in Poland? With, you know, what was your sense that, was it that, was it, did you have any sense that that was the first seeds of the beginning of the end? Not yet. Mm -hmm. The impression I had, I had two impressions. One, I spent a lot of time in the Baltics because we covered them. The US covered the Baltics, visited the Baltics from Leningrad, not from Moscow because of our non-recognition policy. So I had the strong sense that the Baltic countries really were occupied countries, like no kidding. They didn't belong in the Soviet Union. Secondly, I had the impression that the Soviet system just wasn't working. This was a desperately impoverished country that you had like economists who had to scramble to get toilet paper and light bulbs. Okay, I'll tell you a story. So there's a market in, this, in Leningrad for non-working light bulbs. I don't mean selling non-working light bulbs 
as working light bulbs, cheating. No, 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 no. A market for buying light bulbs you know don't work. Why? Because, and anybody who understood the Soviet Union got this and nobody didn't could possibly. There was a market because you would take a non-working light bulb, wait till nobody was looking at your institution, screw, unscrew a working light bulb, put it in your pocket, screw in the working light bulb, the non-working light bulb, hey, presto, you've got a light bulb with some life in it yet, and there was no theft. Okay. What does that tell you? Yeah. Okay, there, what, is that, what, what does that tell you about the economy? Like, there's something wrong here. This is, this, this is not working. And these people are gonna, fi- I thought to myself, these people are gonna figure it out because they're not stupid. But so let's be Gorbachev. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so let's fast forward to, to Gorbachev. And, and uh, so um, you, and, and in the interim, I know you spent some time in Yugoslavia, which is Three years. Uh, at, adding to your perspective on the region. Um, and then back in state, um, on the Soviet affairs desk, if I right, correctly. Right. Then the Polish desk, and then you returned. Um, Polish desk in 1989, best job ever. The Poles so- nailed it that year. Absolutely nailed it. But that's and, another story. Okay, and and because because we want to focus especially on the Soviet experience as opposed to the wider right. region. Right. But but you did then um, get to witness things from Warsaw, correct? That's right. Um, I was in Warsaw in the embassy from ninety to ninety three, and watching the Polish economy and and you know sort of Poland rebuild itself. It was great. But we also were watching the disintegration of the the Soviet Union. And this is how we knew. There there were still 30,000 Soviet soldiers in Poland. And around the end of 90 and all through 91, they were selling off their weapons. There was a black market. There was a flea market at a big soccer stadium um, across the river in in Warsaw. And, And embassy officers would go there and report on what they could see for sale. And the, the Soviet military equipment for sale kept going up in sophistication. First, it was pistols and belt buckles. Pretty soon, it was assault rifles. Then there was like, like machine guns. You could buy them, all right? And I made the, you know, the, uh, uh, I was head of the political section and my, my officers went over there and I said, don't tell me what you're being offered, only tell me what you can see. And we realized we were watching a Soviet Union going out of business sale. Okay, like, and this, this, this was, was, yeah. We were also watching, you know, the, the, the revolts in, in Vilnius. And so the Poles were already free and they were nervous because they knew, you know, there, there were still 300,000 Soviet soldiers in East Germany. There's, well, then the Germany was reunified. Those soldiers were gone, but they were still in Poland and they were nervous. But then we watched the whole thing collapse. So what gave you the first inkling that it was perhaps about to collapse? I mean, because you talk about the, the fire sale. No, you know, the, the Soviet but- Union, I look, the moment you asked, and, I, and I've got to, in all honesty, go back to Poland, because I remember the moment. It was specific. It was, it was November 1988. Hmm. And the Pol- Solidarity and the communists were basically sparring with each other, indirect talks about talks that the Polish Catholic Church was organizing. And I was in my office late, like nine o'clock at night. And I suddenly realized I didn't know how it was going to end. And that was a shock because it was taken for granted that the Soviets would always win. It would always end badly now and forever. And I realized, wait a minute, I don't know how it's gonna turn out. I thought to myself, this could all come crashing down. Communism is now vulnerable in a way it hadn't been since 1945. And I started pacing in my office, sort of muttering to myself. And after that, I knew that the Soviet Union was, I didn't know it was, its collapse was inevitable, but I knew it was possible. 
If communism fell in Poland, it could also fall in the Soviet Union. I knew it. Okay, and so you know, it fell in Poland in '89, and then and then you were in Warsaw from '90, and in '90 things started to go in the Baltics. '91, um, the Baltics were basically pretty much out, and then there was the coup attempt in Moscow in August, oh August 21st, 1991. Oh yeah. So you remember that watching that from Warsaw? I was in Prague on summer vacation, and. There, everyone was nervous. I saw actual couple of communists openly celebrating in the streets. Like, we're coming back, we're coming back. Hmm. And I got in my car and I'm, I drove back to Poland and the Polish border guards, there were still borders then, right? They realized I was from the embassy and they said to me, what's gonna happen? Are the, are the Russians coming back? And I said, I don't know but I'm getting to Warsaw as soon as I can. And boy, they said, we'll give you an escort. And go, Godspeed. Um, and then when Yeltsin faces down the coup plotters and you have this great act of Russian democracy mm. bringing down the Soviet Union, it was a new, you know, this was great. So, after. so from your position uh, as an American diplomat in Moscow, in uh, Warsaw, but watching this, what's happening just to the east, um, what was what was the U.S. government's position? I mean, as as you know, in terms of encourage, to what degree were they encouraging these um, these these republics to declare their yeah. independence? How much were they? I mean, I know that. It was the 17th of September, 20, uh, 1991, when they, the three Baltics became members of the UN. So at that point, the Soviet Union had already basically recognized that they were, they were gone, they were independent. So that's how that happened. And then, but then, as we were just talking about, that autumn was a very, very uncertain time. The, the George H.W. Bush administration struggled a lot with this. There were two camps. There was the camp of supporting Gorbachev and basically hoping that a reformed Soviet Union would continue because that was more stable. And there was the Yeltsin, the pro-Yeltsin camp, people who said, no, the whole structure is rotten, it needs to come down. And you gotta have some respect for the Bush administration's debates. They hadn't expected to be confronted with these kinds of issues and yet they were. And they, they were looking at dark scenarios, right? Yugoslavia had dissolved into civil war, the consequences of which are still with us. There could be more wars in former Yugoslavia. This was bigger and worse. So like, you gotta have some sympathy. Um, you can read Condi Rice's book about this with, with Phil Zelico about the debates and she does an honest job of, of laying it out. So I have some sympathy for them. But of course, it didn't matter what we thought. Mm. It was going down. But the idea, we didn't push it. We would have been happy to see some kind of reformed, looser, you know, post-Soviet Russian confederation existing, but you know, the Ukrainians had, were having none of it, and neither was Yeltsin. And he was probably right, but I'm not gonna criticize the Bush people on that side. Everybody was trying to do the right thing, and, and frankly, they did a good job. Okay, and so, and so as it became now, so end of 1991, um, Gorbachev is out, and you basically, the Soviet Union is now dead. Right. And you've got, all, you've got all these remnant republics now suddenly independent republics, independent states, and the U.S. and Europe, and a lot of our a lot of our audience here is in Europe um, tonight. And uh, there was, you know, I think a great sense of potential opportunity. Right? Uh, it's sure. reunified Europe was sort of a a still off right. the horizon. Right. Exactly. Um, the the 
the, the first order of business was the reunification of Germany, which the Bush administration did very skillfully and reunified it on Western terms, not like Austria in 55 as a neutral state, but reunified it on Western terms in NATO, which was important. That was the precedent. The Bush administration also reached out to Russia um, to and established embassies in the successor, you know, in Ukraine and Belarus and all the successor republics. But neither we nor they had any idea what was going to happen. It was, it was, no one had ever thought that the Soviet Union would collapse. When I was at Columbia in the 1970s, there were lots of courses, but the closest we got to these issues was a course that almost very few people took called the Soviet nationalities mm. by a guy who actually knew a lot about Central Asia and the South Caucasus. And he was regarded as a kind of obscure, strange study. And that was it, Right. that was it. There was no program of post-communist transformation. There was no pro program of post-Soviet politics, nothing. Everybody yeah. was starting from zero. Yeah. Including the countries that were emerging from the wreckage of the Soviet Union, which accounts for why it's been so difficult. And only now is Ukraine dealing with some of the issues that the Poles were dealing with 30 years ago. You know, when I go to Ukraine, it reminds me, you know, half Russia, half Poland in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. One is depressing, the other is really hopeful, and it's both in one country. And when you say that, are you talking about the political reality, the economic reality? Is it the defense and national um, security concerns? Well, I could break it down, but basically the challenge of post-communist, of post-Soviet transformation. And by the way, we made a mistake analytically. We thought post-communist and post-Soviet transformations were basically the same, and they weren't, okay? In the Baltics and in Poland, the memory of pre-communism was still living memory. And the, you know, people who are now my age had been young adults at the beginning of World War II. So like they knew what a real country was supposed to be like. That was all gone. Mm -hmm. in, in Russia, it was completely gone. In most of Ukraine, it was gone. They didn't have it. And it was much, much harder. We didn't know that at the time. We discovered yeah. that later, which is why, you know, it took a generation for Ukraine kind of to, to start having the sorts of debates that the Poles were having in 1991. So, so, okay, now a lot has happened between the 1991 and, and here we are in 2021. Um, you know, obviously the Baltics joined, joined NATO and the EU. Um, and there has been you know, talk of potential further expansions of both, of both, but especially the, the NATO is especially sensitive, uh, potential expansion of NATO. into. Oh, further boy, space. that is a hot issue. Like right now, you know, a lot of Russians are saying we ought to guarantee that Ukraine will never become a NATO member. And of course, as we speak, you know that Putin has massed forces near Ukraine and there's a lot of war talk in Moscow and it's ugly. So you're not, we're not talking history here. We're talking like right today. Are there things that, that didn't happen that shouldn't have, that should have happened to, to, to get this, to get this better to, so that, so that, I mean, you know, there are still, and, and you and I have talked about the fact that Russia still has a military presence, not just in Ukraine, but in Georgia, in Moldova, you know, I mean, it's still it's still very much it's 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 live. These are sort of these are live issues. Yeah, it, you know, it'll get a lot more. It'll get real lively if the Russians invade Ukraine again. I mean, they've attacked it, but it's been a low level conflict since 20 since the end of 2014. Um, the Russians are I don't think they'll go in heavy, but they might. Uh, the Biden administration is pretty worried about that. So this is, you know, today, today, Tony Blinken, the first item on Tony Blinken's press availability at the NATO foreign ministers meeting was on Ukraine and Russia. 
So we're not talking history, we're talking right now. And you know, let's not forget you have Lukashenko attacking, basically using migrants, weaponizing migrants and trying to create incidents at the Polish border to put pressure on Europe, to put pressure on Poland. So, you know, Europe's East is not a stable place these days. Now, I'm going to ask a, a potentially uh, uh, difficult question, is, and that is simply why, so this is clearly on Europe's doorstep. It's clearly in Europe's interests. Why should the U.S., who's got concerns all over the world right now, still be as focused on things like Ukraine, which are, seem so far away to so many Americans? Two world wars and the Cold War. Like, we invested a lot. And with that power comes commensurate responsibility. The, after 1945, we basically tell the, the Europeans, you know, up to the line of the Iron Curtain, you guys have crashed the car one too many times. Now it's us. Now I'm being a little crude, but I'm no longer a diplomat. Mm -hmm. That's basically what we did and it was a success. And after that, after 1989, 91, we were the, the engine of a Europe whole free and at peace. We helped create the United Europe that we celebrate today, right? All these countries, including the Baltics, part of the European Union, and a lot of them part of NATO. Um, we have that power and that, and a united Europe is in our interests. Like I said, two cold, two world wars in the cold war, a united Europe works for us. It's good for America's bottom line. As I say, the principle of good American foreign policy is go set out to make the world a better place and you'll get really, really rich in the process. So um, in a moment, I wanna open up for, for questions from our audience. And we've got some of them that came in uh, in advance. And I'm gonna go to some of those now, actually. Um, you know, there've been several questions related to um, how NATO should handle. So, and, and, and obviously the US being uh, the biggest contributor to NATO, um, how should NATO be looking, handling the, the um, the Baltic states these days, right? So the there's, Baltic. there's, um, there's, so there's, there's, there's Maximilian Skrupchak uh, in Poland has actually sent us this question. How do you perceive U.S. deterrence credibility vis-a-vis -vis Russia on NATO's eastern flank, including a nuclear deterrence? Well, um, it makes sense that a poll would ask that question. I would say this. We're not where we need to be, but we sure are a lot farther off than we were years ago. After the Obama administration never got enough credit for what it did, but after Putin attacked Ukraine, Obama leads NATO to put in battalion strength combat forces in each, what well, one battalion each in Poland and the three Baltic states. Plus, plus the United States put an armored brigade you got that? An armored brigade in Poland. It's rotational. But it's all, there's an armored brigade always there. The Trump administration, to its credit, and maybe despite Trump's own, you know, that's another story, um, strengthened the, U, the U.S. military presence in Poland. So we are in a lot better shape than we were when we didn't have any forces in Europe. 2014, there were zero American tanks in Europe. Zero. Now there's you know, quite a few. And like I said, an armored brigade in Poland. Um, this is where we need to be. We probably need to be doing more. But it means that Putin knows he, 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 he can't go into the Baltic states without tangling with NATO forces. So Thomas Marciner of uh, Columbia's Business School um, Ask, are the Baltic states at risk of Russian invasion in the next 10 years? Well, the answer has to be, you know, the risk is greater than zero. It's, you know, the kind of the war games you look at, 
there are two types. One is that the Russians do a kind of little green men scenario where they send over special forces in unmarked uniforms and pretend that they are local, representing the local ethnic Russian population, sort of what they did in the Donbass. I don't think that would work. One time uh, somebody asked at a conference, asked the Estonian defense minister what he would do if little Russian little green men it called that that's what it was called when the Russians attacked Crimea. If little green men appeared in Eastern Estonia, and he said, hmm, shoot them, which is his way of saying that there'll be a there'll be a fight. I don't think with I think the Baltic militaries can handle this. The other question is whether the Russians go in heavy. Again, you could do a war game or they they do, but those are NATO members. That means the US, Germany, we're all in. That's a war. And they're not going to go in Poland. Poland's army is, you know, Polish military is serious. The Poles aren't fooling around. Um, the danger is the Baltic states. Then you get into various kind of military scenarios of what's possible, and it gets real ugly real fast. But I still don't think Putin is going to take that kind of a chance. Okay. Ukraine is a lot scarier because they're not in NATO. So, so okay. So, and there's a question from Ian Robinson, uh, another business alum, uh, who says, uh, "Would and should NATO be willing to intervene if Russia invaded Ukraine again?" It's funny, I was just having this kind of a discussion, this discussion with a colleague of mine, an ex-DOD assistant secretary. We don't have an obligation to do so. It's a little bit hard to imagine that we would send forces into Ukraine because, and I, I, I've you know, been in too many meetings with JCS, US military. They're not gonna send, put US forces at risk unless they have a, a reasonable chance of prevailing. And that's more of a commitment than we would want to make. But the Ukrainians are willing to fight for themselves. Our, we can help Ukrainians defend themselves by giving them equipment. Now, the British have said they might send in some forces into Ukraine. And I, a couple of people have said, you know, we ought to send in some. That's a stretch. I don't see the Biden administration doing it, but I do see them increasing the military assistance we give to Ukraine so they can defend themselves. Okay. And the Ukrainians will make a fight of it. Um, I want to go back to the Baltics. Uh, there's uh, what looks to me like a Lithuanian name, Ruta Abulaite, um, who is a SIPA alum and has asked back, going back to 1991, says that if there had been no August 1991 attempted coup, in the Soviet Union, would the world have recognized the Baltics as they then quickly did? Yeah, I think we would have got, I think by then the disintegration of the Soviet Union was not, was not stoppable. The Lithuanians, look, I, I remember Landsberg, I knew Landsbergus and some of the defenders of the, um, the Vilnius TV tower. You know, that, that, the fighting, I, I remember that. Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians were going to get out. They were going to force that issue. And we weren't going to let them sit. That debate I mentioned earlier between, you know, sort of pro-Gorbachev, pro-Yeltsin, didn't matter. The Baltics were going to force the issue and we would have, we could do no other having had the policy of non-recognition ever since 1940 in the Wells Declaration. It, if you wanted to stop the disintegration of the Soviet Union after, you know, the, the, the event horizon, so to speak, the inevitable point of inevitability is earlier than the coup. Okay. I think. Um, okay. And uh, broadening the, the discussion a little bit, we've got a question from Laura Heyman's Termai. Uh, who is Harriman Institute class of 13, um, and she was born in Czechoslovakia. So she would like to ask you, Ambassador Fried, about your views on the Velvet Revolution, any personal or professional perspectives? Well, 
the checks the the checks were slow to get started because they were just, they felt nothing could happen. And then in the fall of 89, they realized something could, and, and it was a mass movement that sprang up very quickly, real speed. It was great. It was just great. Um, the, they saw their moment and the whole nation coalesced around an agenda. I don't, I don't want to say the whole nation, but it was a, suddenly dissent went from a, a small group hanging around the Magic Lantern Theater in Prague with Václav Havel and his buddies to a mass movement very quickly. That was great. And I'm, I'm going to uh, step in and uh, as a Slovak citizen myself, and I know Laura, and she would uh, perhaps want to make this point herself, uh, it wasn't just the Czechs. It was the Czechs and the Slovaks. Yes, it was, but I didn't know the Slov. I got to know Slovakia afterwards. You know, Mechar, not good. Zurinda, a lot better. So, all right, great. So, and so I love uh, Bratislava and Stary Smokovets. <laughs> you know, the Tatry. <laughs> I don't, I'm wondering if there is, how many, actually, let me just ask you this. How many of the former Soviet republics have you not visited? Have you been to Central Asia? Have you been to the Caucasus? Yes. Oh, spent a lot of time in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Okay. Central Asia, less time. I don't think I've ever been to Turkmenistan. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. I've been to. Um, but I can't, I don't consider myself a real expert on these areas, but I know them. Ukraine, quite a bit. Okay. You know, especially recently. So there's an interesting of question here. One of my favorites that has come in is, um, it's from uh, Dr. Rodney Taylor, who is a Columbia College alum, and uh, I guess now in France, uh, says, which country in your expert opinion emerged the strongest from the collapse of the Soviet Union and why? So you've just told us you you know you know them almost all of them with some personal dimension, some experience. The strongest in terms of what potential or threat or extent of its post-Soviet transformation. I'll let you, it's not defined in the question, so I'll okay. let you define it yourself. In terms of just general progress, the Baltic states are in a category of their own. But they were, as I, as I think I said earlier, they're more like Eastern Europe. All right, their experience follows a kind, like the Polish trajectory. You know, radical reforms right up front and then a larger payoff pe um, period. Of the other countries, Georgia for a while was looking far better than its South Caucasus neighbors in building a post-Soviet viable economy and democracy. It's been suffering lately. The last year, couple of years haven't been great, but for a while, the, sort of the early years when Saakashvili was president, he had enormous pluses, equally enormous minuses, but he did a lot for the country. And Georgia had a tradition of sort of political liberalism that dates back to the 19th century. You know, I know Stalin and Berea are both Georgians, but there were a lot, there was a Georgian social democratic movement, very strong, that was more numerous and more powerful than the Bolsheviks. You know, the Bolsheviks conquered Georgia he was trying to make a break as an independent republic like the Baltic states, but it didn't survive, you know, in much past the early 1920s. So they did a great job. In Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan made the, the best attempt at kind of transforming itself. But, you know, none of those, they made a lot less progress. And it's, you know, what did we expect? This was the Soviet Union, not Eastern Europe. 
So, you know, and then we get to Ukraine. And I describe that as, you know, it's, it's a combination Poland in the early days and, you know, still a kind of Soviet mentality in one country. But if you want to really feel good about Ukraine, go over there and talk to like younger generation cadre of people that have grown up in a free country. I mean, they're great. It's, it's heartening. And a lot of them are in politics. I mean, they're in parliament. These are good people. And, you know, give them a chance and they'll make this work. And Ukrainian societies consistently voted and acted in favor of a European future for their country, which was not necessarily the case at first, wasn't the case at first. But in this century, you know, 04, then later, you know, 2014 with the Maidan, you know, a consistent progress. Ukraine could really, Ukraine could succeed. Okay, that's a that's a nice hopeful note. Let me let me. I've got some great questions coming in here. Um, I'm going to go to one. Uh, still looking a little bit um, at the experience of the last three decades. So it's from Yusuf Sharif, uh, GSAS09 from Tunisia. So he says. Um, in the early 1990s, there was an aggressive policy of US democracy promotion in the soon to be former USSR and clear as he calls it US triumphalism. Wasn't that the recipe for the birth of a revisionist and nationalist leader like Putin? Wasn't it expected to happen? Well, this, this question reflects a real debate. Now, full disclosure, I was one of the architects of the Clinton administration policy of NATO enlargement. Okay, I mean, I, so yeah, I'm gonna defend that policy, but I gotta explain that I was part of it. Um, but let me take issue with some of, the presum some of the assumptions of the question. Aggressive promotion of democracy means, as opposed to what? Weak promotion of democracy? Ignoring democracy? Placing our bets on authoritarians coming back? I mean, what does that mean? That, uh, that presupposes that democracy is invented in the US and is something we impose on others. Look, I know the Iraq war, you know, has compromised these democracy, people conflate the Iraq war and democracy promotion, but that's not actually what happened in this part of the world. And secondly, we reached out to Russia. I mean, this notion that we were mean to Russia and we bullied it, it's just nonsense. Um, we treated Russia a lot better than they would have than they would have treated had the Cold War turned out differently. We helped them. We didn't humiliate them. We reached out to them. It wasn't like we treated Weimar Germany, beating them up and shunning them and putting reparations on them. We did none of that. We gave them assistance. So the rhetorical answer: What would you have had us do? tell Moscow, it's okay, you can reconquer these countries when you can? Really? So it was a provocative question and oh, I, sure. I, appreciate, I appreciate you taking it on. We've got sure. a couple of, different, couple of different people who are asking about Germany's role. And so there's Dr. Claudia Schreiner who says, which role do you assign or wish Germany to take over in this situation? Asking for your expectation for the new government to come into office and after Angela Merkel will have left her office as someone who kind of mediated between Europe and Russia. So that's the first part of the question. The second part I'll tag on is from uh, Tony Vinal. So Columbia class of 89, Columbia College class of 89 living in Germany asks, do you think Germany should avoid getting gas from Russia? Oh man, those are two excellent and serious questions. Germany's gonna have to make some decisions. And, both, and I'm going to bring both questions together. Look, I, I, I get why Germany wants to reach out to Russia. But, you know, like World War II, it's not you know, feeling a kind of sense of responsibility toward Moscow. Well, what about a sense of responsibility toward Warsaw and Kiev? We need German leadership. We really do. Partners in leadership is something George H.W. Bush said, and he was right. And 
It won't do to give Putin the benefit of the doubt. The notion that, Putin, that the Russians don't use energy as a weapon is risible. Of course they do, they are right now. They don't use energy as a weapon against you in Germany, except they kind of did because they suggested that if Germany wants more gas supplied on the spot market, it ought to approve Nord Stream 2. So they are using gas as a weapon. They are using it for political leverage against Germany. No, I don't think, I wouldn't recommend that Germany not buy any gas from Russia. I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend that they don't let Putin set all of the terms for selling gas. The EU, now I'm going to go all policy won't, but the EU has rules and regulations, including in the energy area. And one of the rules is, um, is basically demonopolization of incoming energy supplies. Well, you know, don't give Putin and his, and his corrupt energy buddies a pass on this. Implement Europe's own rules. And don't let Putin use leverage against us. The Americans, look, my last job in government, I was sanctions coordinator. I, I was co-author of the US sanctions and I was lead negotiator in our with the Europeans. And my experience with Germany in negotiating these sanctions was a really good one, a really good one. Every handshake deal I made at the table, Germany kept up its end. Like, okay, full respect. We gotta do it again, man. Yeah. There's, there's a question here from a fellow alum of the journalism school. So Patricia Grass uh, asks, this is a, uh, little bit of a different vein. She says, did you ever foresee the impact of misinformation and fake news, what those would have on the future of democracy in these countries? No and yes. No, because I didn't until, you know, 2016 was the first time I realized that uh, social media could be used for um, deliberate promotion of disinformation. So no, I had no idea. But yes, because you know, you go back, you read George Orwell, and the same techniques were being used only in an analog world and much slower during the 1930s and then during the Cold War. Very similar. Only then it took weeks. Now it takes hours. So if you think about it, the techniques are actually the same. The no, the 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 objectives, the policy is the same of disinformation. The techniques change because of the, the medium. But even though the techniques are similar, you plant a fake story, you get somebody else to promote it for you. Only then it used to be obscure newspapers moving in toward mainstream publications take a couple of weeks. As I said, now it's ours. And we need to get our act together. Easier said than done as the Americans especially are finding out. Yeah, well, that's for sure. Um, we're, are, we're getting close to the end of our hour. I've got two questions, which I'm going to again group here. And um, they are so one is from Robert Race uh, a, in, in Geneva. And he asks, uh, can the chaos conflicts in the world today, chaos slash conflicts in the world today be traced back to, dis, to the dissolution of the Soviet Union? Where is the peace dividend? And a similar type of question, Alexander Luca in uh, London, who is actually an alum of the engineering school asks, what similarities do you see between then, so 1991 and now? So, you know, a little bit related questions here. Um, I don't think the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a bad thing or created to chaos, okay? Um, it was mostly peaceful, not entirely, but mostly. The Soviet Union was really bad news for the people who lived under the yoke. I don't miss it. I don't think anybody should. Putin misses it. But we know what Putin values. The chaos in the world is not a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Good Lord. There never was a period, you know, the 1980s, so nice. Um, 
where did the peace dividend go? Well, you know, the 1990s were an awfully good decade, not for Russians, but that's on them, not for Yugoslavia, that's on them. But boy, right in Europe, Successful post-communist transformation, rising living standards of United Europe. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, the You could argue that US mistakes in the opening parts, you know, after 9-11 squandered a lot of what we had achieved. And that happily is not the subject of our discussion because, but I could go into detail about that. And then we didn't retool and upgrade the international institutions to deal with rising problems of corruption, of intellectual property rights. We didn't, we, operated under the assumption that an, an economically integrated China would also be a reformed China that would play more by the standard rules. And that was a mistake. That was just wrong. And we're, and we're having to fix that now. And in a lot of areas, we just fell behind at home and abroad. And the Biden administration is trying to fix that. So like, man, big challenges, big problems. Yeah. But yeah. the fall of the Soviet Union is something I do not regret. It really was, as Reagan said, an evil empire. So we are almost out of time. I'm gonna ask you my last question before we close. And mine is looking forward as someone who's, who's still clearly got your finger on the pulse and active in all of these issues, um, looking to 2022. So the next, the coming 12 months or so, make a prediction. What do you see in the former Soviet Union and that part of the world that, you know, any, and I'll let you, you can pick any part of it that you want, something that you think we should be looking out for that may happen. You know, Belarus is the hottest thing right now, but there's, there are certainly frozen conflicts and, and warm conflicts in other places. Watch for Putin's aggression. In the short run, I see danger and problems. <clears throat> looking further out, don't write off the possibility <clears throat> that the Russians will have had enough of Vladimir Putin and where he's taking him, taking them. Don't shortchange democracy and the human desire for a better life. I know that sounds like pathetic stuff these days. I realize not that. Not at all. In the short run, I see problems, dangers, and risks. In the medium term, I become more hopeful, especially if we get our act together in the United States. You know, I serve Republicans and, and Democratic presidents and I don't really care. I do care about democracy and I do care about our getting our act together. Well, there's a bit of hope there and I appreciate, I appreciate that. It's a, it's, a call, it's a call to action and some hope, um, but I think the, and the two don't go without each other. So I'm going to just, I wanna thank you very much, Ambassador Daniel Free. We appreciate the expertise you've shared based on your firsthand experience and your candid views. Thank you so much for joining your fellow Columbia alumni today. And I'm gonna hand it back to our host, Chantel Schuster. If Chantal is, is there, I know she's there. And you should, she's muted, Chantal. Okay, here it is. So here it is. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rick, for a great moderating session, great conversation. Ambassador Fried, thank you very much as well. I join Rick in thanking you for your candid views and also for the hopeful prediction. And I do hope I, I tend, I, well, maybe I'm an idealist, but I think SIPA alumni usually are, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I hope that people will always value freedom more and democracy more than anything else and will wake up at some point. Um, also some great questions from the audience, which I really, really enjoyed, especially from Germany. I lived for a few years in Germany and I still remember uh, American troops being stationed there and all the missiles that were there uh, and all the protests that were going on. I lived in Frankfurt, so we were really in the forefront. Um, so it was it was really great to hear uh, some from some people based in Germany. So thank you very much.
And uh, thank you to all the participants. And again, thank you for all of your great questions. Take care. Thanks for the opportunity. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. -bye.